If you black, you can't hold back. You just gotta, you just gotta roll with it. Let me give you some more examples. Let me give you some more examples of Jerome Crow functioning in the society, right? Affirmative action. Affirmative action is one of the most blatant examples of Jerome Crow. And you see it in action because you got to have a black mayor, right? You just, you have to have a black district attorney. You have to have a black senator. You have to have a black congressman. You have to have a black this, a black that, a pro blackity black, all black around all the time. Right. And it ain't, they don't stop there. Now you got to have a gay one. You got to have a gay one. You got to have a gay this, you got to have a gay mayor. You got to have a gay Senator. You got to have a gay governor. Like you have to have, and then, then you can't forget the trans people. We have to all the categories. You got to have a gay, this, a trans, this, a black, this, a black, that you name the construct, you name the category. They just want you to support it just because. They want us to abandon educational standards because, you know, the black kids can't learn. So, you know, we have to lower the bar and lower the standards and dumb everybody else down. And not just that, but we will discriminate against anybody that performs better than the black kids, especially the Asians, especially the Asians, y'all. That's Jerome Crow. Look at what they did to King Randall's school down in Albany. I mentioned it earlier. You look at how Roland Martin treated King Randall when he had him on his show. I don't know if you saw the show. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. You had an opportunity to see Jerome Crow in action right then and there. There was no regard for the fact that this young man is doing what an entire community of fathers should be doing taking up the mantle to make sure these kids don't become a statistic and we don't want government dependence. So I'll teach them. I'll train them. I'll educate them. I'll make sure that they are equipped with a skill. He represents the purposeful patriarchy and Roland Martin cannot have that because in the Jerome Crow system, if we have purposeful patriarchy, that's too much like right. And we can't have that. So he has to sit there and grill that young man and castigate that young man and attempt to make that young man look like he's just naive and he don't know what he's talking about. What you mean, you know, do for sale? Don't, 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 don't you got to go get a business license? Just dumb and ignorant sound with his roly-poly self. Makes me so angry. It's all things in this Jerome Crow system when you see it in action. It is also all things pro blackity black, no matter what it is, no matter how harmful it is and without distinction. If you black, you can't hold back. You just gotta, you just gotta roll with it because, but they want, they want the, the blacks that I'm talking about, not the American Negro. I ain't talking about y'all. I'm talking about, we might got some in the chat lurking. They sitting there over there looking like Nelly Olson as they listen to this live stream and that's fine. That is okay. That is fine. But the pro blackity blacks, they thrive in agitation and they are experts at propaganda. Experts at it. This, this is why they are given such huge platforms and why they elevate the stories that contribute to the agitation, but they are silent on the ones that don't further their agenda, right? So this is why they, they'll elevate and celebrate a George Floyd, but the young woman who was recently deleted by a mob of, of fatherless ferals, eight black students, black people, scholars, whatever you wanna call them, and tortured this young woman. Mainstream media is silent. I don't see Ben Crump. I don't hear Al Sharpton, Roly Poly, Martin, Joy Reid. None of them have said a thing about this young woman. Is her life not valuable? Right here in Alabama, what they did to that woman was atrocious. Eight people. See, it's the wrong narrative. So we can't talk about that. You guys, these purveyors of perdition, 
They have no interest or desire in improving the lives of Americans in this country. Notice how I said Americans, right? I'm a Negro American, but I'm an American nonetheless. They're not interested in improving the lives of Americans. All they care about is exploiting what is perceived as a legitimate grievance so that their evil, wicked agenda is advanced, which is ultimately, it's, it's, it's multifaceted. It's the destruction of capitalism. It's the destruction of the heteronormative nuclear family Black Lives Matter, we see you. We knew that was a part of your agenda from day one. And then most of all, most of all, it is pushing an anti-God, anti-Christ agenda because these people are secular humanists. And so they don't care about human flourishing because they don't believe in an objective standard of truth as revealed by God through his word. Essentially, they don't have the power to do it, but their desire is to dethrone God, which is not even possible, but in their futile, wicked minds that are always looking for new ways to do evil, they will do their best to try. Ultimately, they, they wish if they could, if they could abolish and stamp out Christianity, they would. Now they can't, you know, I hate to break it to them. You can't, but that, that's basically what they want to do. So the pulpit pimps, you got the pulpit pimps who are the, the democratic operatives. Those, those are your Jamal Bryans and other pastors. They're the ones that openly support and they push these democratic policies. These are what I call the popes of perdition, right? They paddle poison water to the people. And the sad part is if you're not rooted in Christ, you are going to exchange the free flow of living water, which causes you to never thirst again. You will exchange that for this poison water that will keep you spiritually and emotionally dehydrated, living in a perpetual state of oppression and grievance instead of your freedom in Christ. You guys, the freedom in Christ has already been purchased for us by the blood of Jesus. If you're not rooted in that, you will internalize the messaging that these people try to push and you will believe it. You have the propensity to be deceived. That's why their churches are so full, but that's why platforms like this exist because under the sound of my voice, there are sheep who've not been brought in yet, who are stuck in these churches, who are listening to these wicked, toxic messages that don't glory in what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, but rather they want you focused on these perceived grievances and oppression, and they want to pervert the gospel of Christ and turn it into some sort of social justice warrior message, which it is not. It is not that at all. The, 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 the ones who have always been behind Jim Crow or any derivative of such, they've always, always been communistic and socialistic in how they operate. That is not new. Now, we don't necessarily know their names of who these people are in the godless coalition. However, they do have front-facing individuals, and we can point to them. They have front-facing individuals that we can point to and implicate and be like, oh, those are their operatives. So, for example, you guys saw in the thumbnail, you saw I had four black women on the front, and then behind them in black and white, I had President Joe Biden. I had old faithful Margaret Sanger. I had segregationist Robert Byrd. And then I had Miss, I won't say it, Miss Hillary Clinton herself. I'll, I'll be a little more, more gracious. I, sh I struggle in that area. That's an area of sanctification. That's a struggle for me. So y'all stretch out your hand and pray because y'all, this mouthpiece of mine, we ought to talk about uh, Jim Crow Joe for a minute. He's the, he's the current uh, senile darling of the Democrat Party. Um, so we have him, we have Margaret Sanger and Hillary Clinton. And I, because this, I plan to do a series on this whole Jim Jerome Crow paradigm, I'm not really going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them. 
um, because I want to dedicate a whole show to them. Because I saw someone earlier in the live chat was just like, you know, you're always only talking about, you know, what the black people are doing. And, you know, are there any other ethnicities that do anything wrong? Absolutely. Remember Jerome Crow. Jerome Crow is not partiality on the basis of ethnicity. Now, they do use ethnicity, but there were four white folks on that thumbnail that are complicit and equally evil as the four black ones that I put on the thumbnail. And so I'm going to dedicate a whole show, a whole entire show to the Jerome Crow, Jim Crow derivative, the underpinnings that are pushing this new modern construct. We're going to do a whole show, a whole show on that. Let's go ahead and talk about the women of this movement that have a, a, a cloak of invincibility that kind of follows them. And I say this because you can't talk to any black woman just any old kind of way. This, this cloak of invincibility is what we're seeing with both Letitia James and Fonnie Willis, where people are actually defending poor, unethical, just outright ratcheting behavior just on the basis of the fact that you can't say nothing about black women, right? So this is, this is why these women do the things that they do, and this is why they actually believe that they are untouchable. Because who gonna check me, boo? That's the mindset. Perfect example, Letitia James up in New York. Anybody, whether you are white, black, green, or purple, who operates in real estate will tell you that what Letitia James is doing up in New York with Donald Trump and that whole real estate case, it is as wrong as two left shoes. We've never seen this type of tyrannical weaponization. You have a woman who campaigned with the sole intent to bring down one man. She said it out loud. Nobody questioned her and people just voted for her. Cause you know, when you got hatred in your heart, it does motivate you to do some evil things. But what, here's the question I want to ask y'all. This is a little inflammatory, but somebody has to say it. What if an old white Republican man just went and targeted Oprah Winfrey with the sole purpose of bankrupting her and destroying her financially. No legitimate basis, but just for the pure evil of it, right? There's, there's no fraud in Trump's New York real estate case. You have other billionaires like, wait a minute, you trying to tell me that if I say my building's appraised or worth 400, and the bank gets an independent appraisal and they like, okay, you know, 400 works. We'll go ahead and lend you that. And then I pay you back with interest. There's, there's no victim here. This is now a crime that's worth $400 million. You gotta be crazy. So you have Letitia James, Miss who going to check me boo weaponizing the judicial system against a political opponent. You got Joy Reid sitting up there with that drunk wig on her head and she's emboldened to say the wicked things that she says. Y'all that wig is intoxicated, sloppy drunk. It's a sloppy drunk mess, but the despicable nature of her spirit it comes from the pits of hell. She sits up there and she says things like, you know, these old white men when referencing the Republican party, just in general. But what if a white Republican man had the temerity to say, you know, these big black and bougie broads of the Democrat party, y'all would lose your minds. If a white Republican man said that, would that be okay? Would it be okay? You tell me, would that be okay if he just come out and said that? No, it wouldn't be okay. All hell would break loose. Y'all be burning down the street. Hair weaves would be on fire from the anger and the level of festivity that you would have reached. But that woman is allowed to say these things because have any of you ever asked why? Why is she allowed? Why is she on a mainstream network spewing her her evil words 
Why is she allowed to spew what I am now calling state-sponsored hatred? She's allowed to do it because you got welcome to Jerome Crow. That's why. Welcome to Jerome Crow. She's allowed to do it. It's all a part of the, the intimidation, tyrannical bully tactics. And so there, there is so much more that I could say on this topic, but I got to hold some back. I got to hold some back and leave some for later. Right, kind of like James Brown. You know when James Brown is performing and he just, he at the end and he, he bow down and then they put the cape on him and then he take the cape off, he go a little more. This is not that. We're going to save a little bit for later. I got more. I, there's so much more where this came from. However, here's the takeaway for believers. Here's the takeaway for believers because after everything that I just said, we all see this wickedness, right? Like we see it and we need to be honest. If we're just honest, we're like, you know, th this has the propensity to just not make you angry, but it makes you want to do something that does not glorify or honor God at all. I get that, right? But, but as believers, you guys, we have to know that our hope is in Christ alone. We have to know that. We have to believe that with all our heart, soul, minds, and strength because all of this, this, this wicked, evil world, y'all, it's all going to burn up. Like, it's all going to burn up one day, right? All of it is going to be brought to nothing. And, and according to scripture, you guys, we already know how this is going to end. Right, like Christ is on the throne and it's not like he's going to be victorious. You guys, he is victorious. And we, y'all, we have the playbook. So we already know how this is going to play out. We have scripture. Scripture teaches us that particularly, you guys, I'm studying with the ladies on Saturday. We're going through the book of First Peter. And even though the apostle Paul is my favorite apostle, Peter's that dude. And so he's like a, He's a close second. And, and the reason why I have such a, a love and affinity for my brother Peter, because the Peter that was before he penned this epistle, he's not the same Peter. And Peter wrote us the book or the epistle of 1 Peter to remind us, like, y'all, we're going to suffer. Yes, we're going to be persecuted but for doing what is right, right? So the apostle Peter, he exhorted us to remember that we would be persecuted for righteousness sake. Yes, I've spent an enormous amount of time exposing this wickedness. I've even given it a name. I've called it Jerome Crow. Yes, you need to be aware of what's going on. Yes, you need to shield your children and educate and inform your loved ones about what's going on. But what you cannot do, what you cannot do is cause the righteous indignation that wells up on the inside of you to lead you to sin. So you, you got to turn it in to something productive and useful that glorifies God. Because in this life, we are to live as servants submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. That is our mandate. That is who we are. And that is what we're supposed to be. And y'all listen, I'm not telling you this because I've mastered this. This is a hard word for me. Okay. I'm the type of when something pop off, I'm like, when we rolling out, like I'm ready. Let's, let's get it. That's me. Right. But we lead with the proclamation of this great and glorious gospel. That's what we have to leave with. We lead with that. And that gospel, it has changed us and transformed us from the kingdom of darkness, translated us to the kingdom of light, right? Like we can silence and bring our enemies to shame when we just live upright before the Lord, despite what they are doing. And we can demonstrate with our character, with our conduct, that we're just different. Y'all, this world is not my home. I love this home. 
I love the life that God has granted me with. Every day I work, wake up breathing his oxygen, saying thank, thank you and giving thanks to God for that. However, I'm emboldened to say the things that I say because I think about the brothers and sisters in the Lord who came before me, right? I'm, I'm emboldened to say the things that I say just like John the Baptist was because I know that my life is hidden in the Messiah. Don't tell me that John the Baptist didn't know that. Once he found out that Jesus was who he said he was, John was like, listen, um, it is unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. Like he tells Herod the king that it was unlawful for him to have his brother's wife. And John stood there, y'all, and he said it with his chest. He said it with his chest and it bothered King Herod. But do you know who it really angered? It, it, it angered that a ratchetane wife Herodias of his, of King Herod and her evil daughter who was so angered by John's words that she demanded John, John the Baptist's head be placed on a platter. Just that statement, it is unlawful for you to have your, your brother's wife cost John the Baptist his life. And do you think that John was trying to preserve his life at that point? Y'all, John's like, I don't already trust it in Christ. I don't trust it in the Messiah that's to come. So now I have no fear of what anybody can do to me, right? Like losing his head was just a small price to pay for the glory that was to be revealed. So as believers, we have to get accustomed and comfortable with the fact that as believers, y'all, we going to always be out of place. Like we just always going to be like the awkward kid at the dance is like standing in the corner, like. So you might want to dance with me. No, you don't want to dance. You can have half of my sandwich if you want. Like, we're always going to be that awkward kid. And it's okay. And I get it. Like, the information that I have shared tonight, or should I say the perspective that I've shared, you guys, it's true. And it's right, although it was very inconvenient and hard for many people to hear. It must be told. However, we got to keep our eyes focused on Christ, right? Like we have to recognize that the hatred for righteousness, it may seem like it's directed toward you, but y'all, their target is really Christ. Their target is your father in heaven. They have no victory and no power over Christ. And as his ambassadors, you guys, we should expect the hatred and the persecution that comes our way. I want to I want to leave you guys with this exhortation. I want to read to you guys from 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. And it says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, Bless for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing for whoever desires to love life and to see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and go and do good. Let him seek peace. And pursue it. That's why Christians be like, can you just leave us alone so we can mind our business? Like, we just want to pursue peace, if at all possible. As much as it depends on us, we just want to be left the heck alone. And we also, we like, we just want to love you. We understand that you're adversarial to our message and the God that we serve. But it still demands that we love our enemies, and y'all, that is the hardest part. I'm not gonna sit here like in my level of sanctification that I'm just there because I'm not. But I have to, I have to exhort myself and I have to stay tethered to the word of God myself and encourage you to do the same so that we don't try to retaliate or repay evil for evil. But let me continue. It says, for the eyes of the Lord 
are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. You guys, that's us. That's the brethren of all shapes, colors, stripes, black, white, green, yellow, purple, all of us from every tribe, nation and tongue. You got to remember that. But the face of the Lord, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We have to believe that too, right? Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you do, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, y'all, that implies that, uh, you know, you're doing good and you're zealous for good works. But the if part implies that it's a possibility we're going to suffer. And we got to we got to wrap our minds around that. Make sure we're rooted and grounded in Christ and keep our eyes focused on Christ. It says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame for it is better to suffer for doing good. If that should be God's will, then for doing evil, right? I think about the situation that's going on in my city right now. And in this County where a church was used as a platform to gaslight and to obfuscate genuine repentance. And I think like, you know, if the scripture is saying for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's, God's will than for doing evil. Like there's, this demonstrates that there is a sinful suffering that many of us can experience. And then there's suffering for doing good. And it ain't, we not supposed to suffer because of our sin Right. Like, well, no, we will suffer for because of our sin, but that's not the kind of suffering that is being positioned here as if it is good. It is suffering for doing what is good and not for what is evil. But here's why we can rejoice. And despite the suffering, despite the persecution, knowing that these people have hatred toward us, not for necessarily who we are, but for who we represent. This is the glorious part. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Y'all, that is the great exchange. That's a glimpse of this beautiful gospel that we cling to. That one man was able to live this sinful, perfect life coming as the God man, God in the flesh right? Who suffered one time for all of us filthy, wretched, wretches undone. Y'all, we, we filthy. Okay. Even if all you ever did was steal a pack of gum, we just read that God is holy. So God is holy and we're not. Even if all you ever did was steal a pack of gum, it's like you sinful. You're sinful. And you're not fit for eternity. You're not fit for eternal life. So here's what you needed. You needed Christ to suffer once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. The unrighteous is who we were, right? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went Y'all, and he proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, 
now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Y'all, all of the evil wickedness that I talked about with Jerome Crow and the construct of Jerome Crow and how everything it seems that these people represent is godless and wicked. And it is. Oh, it is. That part is true. We are told here that all of that is subject to him. And so if we on this side of eternity, happen to experience persecution, happen to experience the suffering for doing what is right. Y'all, we are in good company because our Savior suffered once and for all. And it is nothing compared to the glory that is to be revealed in the last time. And so we rejoice, clinging to our hope in Christ alone, knowing that our sin is atoned for and that all things will be made right at the coming of Christ again. And so while I can educate you on these things so that you'll know how to move, when you see this stuff, you're like, oh, okay, that's Jerome Crow. I see that. Okay. Well, what we do is we give these people the gospel, right? You can't cling to the good news of the gospel if you don't know what's wrong. If your sin, if no one has ever told you that your sin separates you from a righteous and holy God and that your sin has the wrath of God on you, right? You're, you'll be a recipient of God's wrath because of your evil, wicked deeds. Giving the gospel is what we're supposed to do. And it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So this is why I can stand in solidarity with all kinds of Christians, black ones, white ones, Hispanic ones, Indian ones, Asian ones. We come from all tribes, tribes, tongues, nations to the four corners of the earth. Those are my people. I don't stand in solidarity with anyone on the basis of your ethnicity. The unity that I have with the people of God is based on the unity that we have in what God has done for us in Christ. By grace through faith, we are saved. And so that's why I can't get caught up in, you know, well, why you, why you only talking about the black people? Because right now they doing stuff wrong, strong and wrong, and they look like me. So I'm going to tell them because I love them. I love them enough to tell them the truth that God is not pleased with this ethnic partiality and this Jerome Crow politically inspired, uh, uh, I hate using the term racism and the weaponization of tyranny and trying to shout down people who disagree with them. If your arguments and if your positions and constructs and categories are so great, why you have to silence everybody else? You can't have your argument stand in the public square of public opinion and be weighed and argued. No, you can't. Because when examined against the objective truth of God's word, it falls apart and it's exposed for the wickedness that it is. 